So I'm John and I'm a rising sixth year uh, MEM student in HST. Um, I work with Bruce Rosen and Matthew Hemelainen at the Martino Center, uh, mostly with MEG and EEG data analysis and modeling. Um, today, I will talk about something entirely different though. Um, so the, uh, maybe not so grand, but the finale in any case, uh, of the symposium will be um, talking about the machine learning uh, in healthcare, specifically the regulatory uh, regulatory framework um, that comes if you want to get your AI algorithms into the clinic. So I discussed that I have no conflicts of interest. For the sake of full disclosure, I should say that I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so please don't take this as legal advice and this is not my area of expertise whatsoever, so please feel free to point out if you see any mistakes or any other errors in this uh, presentation. Uh, so the first thing to determine when asking what the regulations are regarding the use of machine learning in healthcare is to classify it, since the legal framework depends on what legal object it belongs to. Not all, but most machine learning algorithms in healthcare would be regarded as a software as a medical device, abbreviated SAMD. The definition of a software as a medical device, you can see in the lower left corner of the slide here, is software intended to be used for one or more medical purposes that perform these purposes without being part of a hardware medical device. So emphasis here is on without being part of a hardware medical device. So for instance, the firmware uh, in an MRI machine or embedded system that regulates ventilator movement do not belong to the SAMD category, but should be regarded as a software in a medical device, SIMD software used in the manufacture or maintenance of a medical device is sort of the third subcategory of software in healthcare. Software in healthcare is in turn a subcategory under medical devices. So in the end, a machine learning algorithm used in healthcare is regulated as a medical device. As such, it is regulated by the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, which is one division within the FDA umbrella, whose mission is to assure that patients and providers have timely and continued access to safe, effective, and high quality medical devices and safe radiation emitting products. Broadly speaking, the CDRH regulates medical devices along two major axes. So on the first axis, we have the different categories of medical devices, such as hardware or software in or as part of a medical device, etc. On the other axis, uh, there are different categories pertaining to the risk malfunctioning of the device would pose to the patient. This is generally the more important axis because this is what determines the legal steps and rigor you need to go through to get your medical device on the market. So the CDRH groups medical devices into three broad uh, risk, risk categories, class one, two, and three. Class one devices are those not intended for use in supporting or sustaining life or of substantial importance in preventing impairment to human health, and they may not present a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. So examples here are bandages, beds, and masks. Class one devices are only subject to general controls that are the same for each device, and most of them, about 74%, I think, are exempt from filing a pre-market submission uh, or a 510K. Uh, which is a pre-market notification to the FDA that demonstrates the effectiveness and safety of the device. Class two devices are those for which general controls are insufficient to provide reasonable assurances of the safety and effectiveness of the device. As such, class two devices are subject to device-specific special controls in addition to general controls. Most class two devices are not exempt, but do require a 510K before marketing, so that's the difference between class one and class two devices. And then finally, we have class three devices that usually sustain or support life, are implanted or present a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury, and as such poses the highest risk. An example of class three devices are pacemakers and, and ventilators. Most class three devices do require a pre-market approval or PMA, which is the most rigorous type of device marketing demanded by the uh, FDA. Now, which of these three classes your machine learning software will be classified as depends primarily on two things. Firstly, there is significance of information provided by SAMD to a healthcare decision. That is, how critical is the role? Does it inform clinical management, in which case it poses a lower risk? Or does it drive clinical management, or even in by itself treats or diagnose, in which case it poses a higher risk? Secondly, we have the state of healthcare situation or condition. 
If the healthcare situation where it is deployed is critical, like an ICU or life-saving operation, then it poses a higher risk than a serious or non-serious situation, like a routine visit to an outpatient clinic. These risk levels are from the International uh, Medical Device Regulators Forum, but correspond roughly to the FDA risk categories. So to get your SAMD device to market, you typically will need a 510K, PMA, or de novo submission. I've already mentioned the 510K and PMA, which are the normal routes and depend on whether the, the device belongs to risk class two or three. The de novo submission is another pre-market submission instead of the 510K or PMA for entirely novel devices, where there currently is no predicate on the market. It is only available for risk categories one and two, so you need to prove that general and special controls are sufficient and that your device therefore belongs to class one and two to be el eligible for this de novo pathway. For instance, the first AI-powered FDA-approved software, DRIDX, was brought to market through a de novo application, which I will return to later. This mentioned regulatory framework and risk classes apply to all SAMD devices in general. However, there is a certain uniqueness of machine learning as a medical device in that it is often more autonomous. And while software for clinical use traditionally follows a straight pipeline of first development, then testing, then approval, then use, we usually want to keep updating and adapting the machine learning software as more patient, patient data keep uh, come, come uh, streaming in. So in that sense, we want the relationship between the development and test phases be less unidirectional and more like a bidirectional circle as illustrated in this diagram here. The FDA published a discussion paper on this in April last year where this was discussed and how this poses new challenges to the regulatory agencies. On the one hand, FDA realizes the immense promise of getting AI into the clinics. On the other hand, it is their responsibility to ensure the safety of devices. So to serve both needs, FDA has proposed a new regulatory framework specifically tailored for machine learning. So traditionally, algorithms need to be locked. Locked being defined as an algorithm gi giving the exactly same output for the same input after they are submitted to the FDA for pre-market approval and then use. The developer can keep acquiring usage data and keep developing their algorithms. But when the developer wants to release a major update, uh, it first needs to get a new pre-market approval from the FDA. And when submitting this update for approval and, and later on clinical use, everything needs to be set and locked. In other words, this regulatory framework does not allow for this continuous online learning and adaptation that we would prefer for machine learning. So what the FDA is now proposing is a new framework based on a total product lifecycle or TPLC approach, wherein manufacturers in their initial pre-market submission outlines what modifications might take place in the future. The regions of possible changes are drawn up in the SAMD pre-specifications or uh, SPS, uh, which outlines the nature of modifications. If modifications will only be in performance or in inputs or in intended use. The protocol for implementing those changes are then defined in the algorithm change protocol or ACP, which specifies the procedure for exactly how the modifications will be implemented while maintaining the safety standards. So things like data management, retraining, performance evaluation, update procedures uh, should be included in the ACP protocol. After the device has been approved then, the manufacturer can then continuously update their algorithm based on new user data without having to go through a new pre-market submission every time they want to issue an update. Thus, this new regu regulatory framework would be in the form of a total product lifecycle uh, rather than the step-by-step -step framework that is currently in place. However, to make sure that the device stays safe for clinical use, the FDA proposes a protocol for when the manufacturer needs to obtain new approval and when the manufacturer can release the update without seeking new approval. Because in the end, you're not gonna give um, a manufacturer of medical devices a complete carte blanche just because they use machine learning. You see an overview of this protocol in the flowchart here, which I have taken from the FDA white paper from last year, uh, which I have simplified a bit for, for the uh, sake of clarity. So basically this framework states that if the modifications are within the agreed SPS and ACP protocols, which were a part of the initial pre-market submission, 
then you only need to document the changes and follow the modification protocols as, uh, as outlined in the uh, ACP. If they are outside the agreed SPS and ACP, but do not change the intended clinical use, the FDA will perform a review of the SPS and ACP, which if approved leads to an updated pro protocol after which the manufacturer can update the software in, accord in accordance with this newly approved ACP. If the modifications are outside the SPS and ACP and they lead to a new intended use, then the manufacturer will need to seek a new pre-market approval. That was an overview of the overall regulatory framework concerning use of machine learning in healthcare, but machine learning as a medical device can be grouped into subcategories. And since this is a neuroimaging symposium, I'll focus a bit on machine intelligence in medical imaging, which is one of the most vibrant fields of um, using uh, machine learning in, in, uh, uh, in healthcare. So the first and biggest subfield within machine intelligence and medical imaging is quantitative imaging or, or QI, which is roughly defined as extraction of quantifiable features from medical images and can thus provide a, a biomarker when these quantifiable features relate to a specific physiological condition. Generally speaking, the goal of QI is to move medical image interpretation from a qualitative and subjective process done by a radiologist to a more quantitative and objective process. We have seen quite a few examples of this uh, in the previous talks today. We then have computer-aided diagnosis, or CAD, which is defined as machine learning, uh, AI, data analysis, applied to medical images intended for computer-aided detection or diagnosis. We also have other applications such as image registration, reconstruction, segmentation, denoising, autonomous AI decision making, etc. We've seen an example of uh, this as well in the previous talks. A notable example of the latter is IDXDR, which I mentioned earlier, which, which is the first uh, AI based medical device approved by the FDA on April 11, 2018. This device is a software program that uses an AI algorithm to analyze retinal images and notifies the clinician whether only mild or more than mild uh, diabetic retinopathy has been detected. I believe that uh, Dr. Kalpathy Kramer, who is with us here today, has done a lot of work in this area. Since I think many people here are specifically interested in quantitative imaging, let us dig into that a little bit deeper. So what is actually needed in a pre-market submission for a quantitative imaging function? Firstly, a function description that describes the QI function and the quantitative imaging value, which is the output of that function. This value has to be a ratio or interval variable. <coughs> Excuse me. That is, the difference between two values has to be meaningful. So ordinal and nominal variables, for example, classifiers, are not considered uh, quantitative imaging values, which was a bit surprising to me. <clears throat> Basically, the function description should make sure that the FDA understands exactly how, for what, and under what conditions the device should be used for. It should also include quantitative performance specifications, which I will return to in a moment. Finally, we should have user instructions or labeling, as it's called in FDA lingo. Device labeling should include uh, sufficient information for the end user to obtain, or obtain and understand and interpret the values that is being provided by your QI function. So the biggest part of the pre-market submission is the technical performance assessment. The FDA recommends that the technical performance assessment follows 10 steps, but these steps are more of a recommendation of good things to include rather than an exhaustive checklist. The appropriate performance specifications will depend on the intended use of the QI function, its, its complexity and the availability of reference values. I do not have time to go through this in detail in the 50 minutes uh, time window of this talk. Uh, for a thorough description, I have to refer to the reference um, <coughs> FDA paper from last year, which goes through this in more detail, but I have compiled a very rough summary of uh, these steps in this list. So basically it should define the QR function, its relationship to the measure end and the use conditions. For example, this could be a volumetric uh, lesion measurement from MRI data applicable to images of a specific resolution collected on a specific MRI system. It should then uh, determine the performance metrics and characterize the performance of this QI function under the predefined conditions. 
In, in this mentioned example, performance metrics could include accuracy as measured in linearity between actual size and estimated size, as well as bias or precision as measured in reproducibility or repeatability. That is if we get the same volume of scans taken after each other or um, at different times. You then set the a priori acceptance criteria regarding these performance metrics and set restrictions on limitations uh, on usage as well as specify the elements of your study plan that will support your, your claims like the statistical design and the data requirements and the analysis plan. Then finally, you perform the study and you compare the results with your predefined acceptance criteria. So to summarize, machine learning in healthcare is regulated as a medical device under the software as a medical device, SAMD category. Regulations and pathways to market generally depend on risk, which in turn depends on the situation in which the software is being deployed and its task. As of now, algorithms need to be locked prior to pre-market submission, but the FDA has proposed a new total product lifecycle or TPLC approach, which would allow for continuous learning and adaptation as more user data comes streaming in. Machine intelligence and medical imaging is one of the most vibrant fields in machine learning as a medical device. Quantitative imaging or QI is an important subfield here with a, with a specific regulatory framework that I mentioned. And with that remark, I think it's a good time to uh, leave over for discussion. Um, I hope this was instructive and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gallup for the help in uh, preparing this talk.